Hey, what is up guys? Murgerman4 here. And it's been a while, but I'm finally back to review some more classic Doctor Who. This time it's season 9, right in the middle of John Pertwee's tenure as the Doctor. So strap in as I tell you what I think of the politics of Peladon, the mutations of Solos, and everything in between. These are my thoughts on season 9. <laughs> By this point, John Pertwee's third Doctor was well and truly established, with the regular cast of unit characters providing a comfortable home base, a regular foe in the Master, and the gradual relaxation of the Doctor's exile providing more space and time travel than the show had seen in years. The third Doctor's era was finally beginning to break free of its shackles without straying too far from the aspects that make it unique even 50 years later. So let's start off with the return of the Doctor's greatest foe in Day of the Daleks. Marking the long-awaited return of the Daleks after a five-year rest, it's ironic that they are, by far, the weakest aspect of the story. Louis Marx's script is one brimming with ideas, and whilst limited by the show's budget, the dystopian future the gorillas call home is well realized, and their plot to travel back in time to prevent their hellish existence, only to ultimately become the cause of it, is a fantastic premise that the story really runs with. Indeed, the Daleks are just background dressing, with the plight of the humans forming the meat of the story, filled with shades of grey. The gorillas are fighting for a good cause, but are they so blinded by desperation that they forget the value of human life? Then there's the Controller, a man who commits terrible deeds to protect his own life in the belief that resistance is futile. Until the Doctor convinces him there is hope, and he sacrifices himself so that the Daleks can be vanquished. I do think my view on the televised version of the story has been colored slightly over the years. Primarily due to reading the novelization, which faithfully adapts all the brilliant bits and carefully fixes up the flaws, but the TV version is still well worth revisiting and remains a standout of the Third Doctor's era. So for that, I'll be giving Day of the Daleks a respectable 8 out of 10. I don't know what it is about Peladon, but I've never really clicked with it. I just find the planet and its people dull. There's no real way around it. This is a competently made story. Well scripted, solid acting, some decent plot twists, neat production design, but for whatever reason I just struggle to connect with or care about what's going on. David Troughton's King Peladon is probably the highlight. It's a memorable performance filled with passion and sympathy, and the struggle between following tradition and doing what's right is a powerful one. I also have to give the story credit for giving us a new take on the Ice Warriors. Not as enemies, but allies, with the story cleverly playing with the viewer's expectations. It's a refreshing use of a returning monster, and a stark reminder that, like humanity itself, alien species are not black and white, inherently good or evil. So because of aspects like that, I can't be too harsh on the Curse of Peladon. But the fact remains that I just find it a struggle to get through, and I'm certainly not in a rush to revisit the story anytime soon. So for that, I'll be giving it a 6.5 out of 10. The Sea Devils is a story that has gradually gone up in my estimations with every rewatch. While I don't think it holds a candle to its predecessor, Season 7's Doctor Who and the Silurians, it's still a solid sequel, and while the bare bones of the story is the same, the details are different enough that it makes for a wholly different experience. For one thing, the water-based approach of the Sea Devils themselves is really refreshing, as it's an environment we rarely explore in the show. And of course, the Sea Devils are an extremely memorable design that feel completely different to their Salurian cousins, even if their motivation is largely the same. The Sea Devils also throws in a curveball with the inclusion of the Master, always a welcome presence with Roger Delgado clearly having a ball. I love that the story picks up from where we last saw the Master, taken away to prison, except inevitably he's taking control and there's a lot of fun to be had with the Master scheming away from inside a cell. While not flawless, The Sea Devils is a fun story with a lot of charm that I don't think I gave proper credit to in the past. On the whole, it's a solid 7.5 out of 10. <sighs> Who thought? 
thought we needed six episodes of this. Okay, The Mutants is not entirely devoid of positives. The core idea is actually a pretty great one. I quite like the campness of the Marshal, and the designs of the eponymous mutants are genuinely excellent. But I'm sorry, this story is just such a slog to get through. I find it very hard to care about the characters or engage with the culture and history of the planet Solos, with the mystery of the Time Lord's message dragging on for far too long, and the conclusion that the mutants are just a natural part of the Salonian's life cycle, and that their ultimate form is something far greater and more powerful, simply isn't delivered in a satisfying way. And really, that's all I have to say about it. Some great ideas that are totally and utterly wasted, and delivered in a boring, overlong package. Because of that, I can't justify giving the mutants anything higher than a 3.5 out of 10. The Time Monster is an interesting story. I feel like my thoughts on it are constantly flipping back and forth, because there's a good amount that I really like in concept, but execution is another story. A being that eats time itself? That's awesome! But when the creature is mostly reduced to just flapping around in a distinctly unthreatening costume and has very little opportunity to demonstrate its powers, it's just underwhelming. Same with the concept of other time periods bleeding into the present. What little we do get is very cool, but it's severely underutilized and the story chooses to spend its time on less interesting things. In particular, despite some good material as the Master tries to charm his way into ruling Atlantis, I struggle to actually care about its fate. I really wish the Time Monster was a more focused story, because it's easy to see its potential, and I think I'd actually really enjoy it if it was given a more polished script. As it stands, I can never fully gel with it, but to its credit, one thing it can't be accused of is being boring, because it really is ambitious, even if it doesn't quite stick the landing. So I'll be giving the Time Monster a 6 out of 10. Far from perfect, but I've seen a lot worse. Unfortunately, I've never really clicked with Season 9, and this recent rewatch has done nothing to change that opinion. It's a season filled with middling, largely forgettable stories. Not without its highlights, but they feel few and far between. The biggest redeeming factor for me is undoubtedly the main cast. I've mentioned in my other Third Doctor reviews just how incredible a pairing John Pertwee and Katie Manning are, and the unit family plus Roger Delgado's master are always a joy, even when the story they're in is lacking. But, yeah. Season 9 is very much the definition of mid-Doctor Who for me. There are a couple stories I'm keen to revisit, but the season as a whole, I'm more than okay to leave it be for a while. So, with that said, how does Season 9 stack up on the whole? Well, for me, the best of the bunch is Day of the Daleks, with an 8 out of 10, followed by the Sea Devils with a 7.5, the Curse of Peladon with a 6.5, the Time Monster with a 6, and finally the Mutants with a 3.5 combining to make an overall average of 6.3 out of 10. Unfortunately, this places Season 9 fairly low amongst the seasons released so far in the collection, only coming above Seasons 19 and 24, though tailing ever so slightly behind 17. This lowers the average score of the 1970s to 7.14 out of 10, and John Pertwee's era to 7.1 out of 10, who now falls behind both Bakers. When it comes to writers, the highest placing is Louis Marx in 19th with a 7.33, while writing duo Robert Sloman and Barry Letts dropped to 21st with a 7.17. Malcolm Hulk comes in 24th with a 7 out of 10, with Dave Martin and Bob Baker close behind in 26th and 27th place, respectively, and with a 6.6 .6 and 6.5 out of 10. Finally, Brian Hales marks the only new addition to the writer's ranking in 29th with a 6.5 out of 10. Barry Letts continues to remain firmly in the middle of the producer's ranking, with an average of 7.22 out of 10, while script editor Terrence Dix moves down from 4th to 6th place with a new average of 7.1 out of 10. As for Season 9's directors, Paul Bernard and Lenny Main both drop to an average of 7.17, coming in 18th and 20th place respectively, while Michael E. Bryant remains in 22nd with a 6.9, and Christopher Berry coming in just behind him in 23rd with a 6.67 out of 10. To this season's credit, despite largely missing out on any high scores, Day of the Daleks does have the privilege of being my favorite season premiere I've reviewed so far, increasing the premiere average to a 6.96 out of 10. Unfortunately, the Time Monster doesn't fare so well, coming in 10th of 13 and dropping the finale average to a 6.85 out of 10. Despite doing so well with the premieres, 
Day of the Daleks wasn't quite strong enough to crack my top 10, but The Mutants does find its way into the bottom 10. Overall, of the 73 stories I've reviewed so far, Day of the Daleks comes in 18th, The Sea Devils 35th, The Curse of Peladon 54th, The Time Monster 59th, and The Mutants 69th. Just four from the bottom spot. And those are my thoughts on Season 9. Unfortunately, while my thoughts on individual stories actually shuffled around quite a bit, on the whole, my outlook on John Pertwee's third season remains the same. Largely disposable and not nearly as exciting as the seasons that preceded or followed it. But those are just my thoughts. What do you think of Season 9? Please let me know in the comments below. And with that, Mergaman 4, over and out, and I'll see you next time with my review of Season 20. <laughs>